good afternoon. Uh, I'm Pastor Jeff Johnson here at First Lutheran, and I know most of you know me. I'm glad you're here, and I look forward to meeting you. If you we haven't met before, and I'm really honored you're here today, given the circumstances of the nation and the world. Um, and fortuitously, we have the mayor with us today, so we can direct some of our questions and concerns towards him. A couple of things beforehand, some housekeeping. Um, many thanks to uh, uh, the Pastor's Aid Ministry for today's meal. Thumbs up, yes. Okay, good. So anyway, there's plenty in Newburgh. I'm sure if you want to take some to go, you can take some Newburgh to go. Um, and uh, I know there are plenty of biscuits, so <laughs> make sure you take some biscuits. Um, if you need uh, flyers for concert series or door hangers, the door hangers have both concert series and the Linton Luncheon series on them. Please grab them. We had a wonderful um, concert last Sunday with the organ. Uh, one of the organists at Trinity Copley Square was here, Colin Lynch. Uh, a number of you came. We had about 50 people there for that concert. Um, and he played beautifully. And we televised it, or we had him television monitor him on him while he played. So um, um, I'm thrilled that we have these sorts of events. Um, coming up, uh, we have a choir that's going to be here at the end of the month from Attleboro, our pleasure um, singers. And in late April, we have Victor Romuald, one of the, uh, he's a violinist with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He'll be here with us. Um, next week, is uh, Kathy Bales with Old C uh, Colony Y, elder services. She's going to talk about specific elder services care that um, Old Colony Y offers, the county offers, and those, I, I just put them in the category of ministries, that those are offered by um, those things that, frankly, our taxes pay for, and that are, are services to us and to people who need them. The last Lenten lunch which is in April, I believe April 3rd, is our annual Broadway sing-along. I have pieces of paper, slips of paper, for you to fill out your favorite song that you want us to sing. I'll be playing again, so um, bring a friend, because we had a ball with that last year, and uh, I would like to have equally as much fun with it this year. Um, given the circumstances of life, um, I do want to share, I rarely preach at these events, and I'm not preaching to you, but I'm offering you words of consolation. As I was telling my, my luncheon table here, um, my hometown was devastated by a Category 5 hurricane two years ago, um, which completely shut it down for six months almost. My father had to come live with me for two months. Um, and I've been through many storms in my life like that because I grew up in Florida. It's a, it's a piece of life. I've lived in California where there are earthquakes. I lived in Manhattan during 9-11, less than a mile away from ground zero, and there is nothing like terrorism. That's something that is much more deeply, obviously, terrifying and insidious than this. Um, but what I wanted to offer you today was actually the experiences of Martin Luther during one of the bubonic plagues. And we forget that the plague hit Europe constantly, starting in the 14th century, and it would come visit a town, devastate it, and then people would have to pick up the pieces. One of the things most people's minds don't immediately think of, but partly because it isn't discussed that much, is when the plague came to Wittenberg. That's the town Luther lived in. The bubonic plague was particularly nasty disease spread primarily through the bites of fleas carried by small rodents. Though it was air, also airborne, it could be spread by handling the infected. So um, the plague was particularly violent, and one day the infected could shine, show signs of fever, delirium, speech disorders, and loss of consciousness. The likelihood of survival was incredibly low, depending on various conditions. In August of 1527, the plague struck Wittenberg, and the numerous people fled in fear of their lives. Martin Luther and his wife, Katerina, who was pregnant at the time, remained in their beloved city in order to treat the infected. Despite the calls for him to flee Wittenberg with his family, Luther's mind was set on helping the infected. He inv inv 
inevitably came to the conclusion that it was not inherently wrong for one to so value their life they did not remain. But only so long as the sick had someone of greater faith than they to care for them. He balanced his position with the conviction that this one of greater faith ought not to condemn the one of weaker faith who fled. Yes, and I'm quoting Luther here. <coughs> Yes, no one should dare leave his neighbor unless they are other, there are others who will take care of the sick in their stead and nurse them. In such cases, we must respect the words of Christ, I was sick and you did visit me, Matthew 25. According to this passage, we are bound to each other in such a way that no one may forsake the other in his distress, but is obligated to assist and help him as he defends, as he would, as he would like to be helped. In other words, Luther maintained that there was an obligation to help those who contracted the plague. And I could read you more, but I'm not. But, but I just want to let you know that that is our job as Christians, especially Lutheran Christians. We have this great heritage of being present for everyone at every time in any sort of circumstances. First Lutheran is not shut down until we are shut down by forces that cannot allow us to continue. I know that Grace Chapel is not either or the other congregations that worship here. Um, our doors are open for the city and um, worship on Sunday will commence as it always have with precautions around um, infection. So I just wanted to let you know that. Mayor, I did not mean to steal your thunder with that, but I think it's important important to let that know as a, as a sacred institution that serves the greater um, community that we are indeed a community center and we care for not only our own parishioners but the citizens of Brockton. So with that being said, please help me welcome Mayor Bob Sullivan. Good afternoon. I want to thank Pastor Jeff. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you to come here today. I want to thank you for the invitation. Uh, the last time I came here, I was the city council president, and uh, uh, the late Jim Benson and actually the late Kyle Landerholm invited me to be here. Um, so I want to thank you for coming to, to listen to me. Now, I'm not the city council president. I'm the mayor of the city of Brockton, uh, and I'm proud to stand here in that capacity. I was born and raised here in Brockton. My dad was a teacher at Brockton High School. My mom was a nurse here in the city, and my wife, uh, she's from Brockton. Her, actually, her grandfather had a small shoe uh, business here in Camp Pello, Louise Shoe. Paul Louisi. Um, so Maria and I are raising our three kids here in the city of Brock. I do want to recognize my fellow elected official, Eldon, from West Bridgewater. Thank you. Good to see you. Um, <clears throat> I'm here today, first of all, to tell you who I am and why, uh, why I think Brockton is just a wonderful place to, uh, to live, to work, to raise children. Um, I'm a Roman Catholic. I go to Mass every Sunday up at the Lady of Lords on West and Torrey Street. It doesn't matter what religion you are, you know, we all follow the teachings of Jesus Christ on a daily basis. So when I was elected mayor, um, Mark Oliver, Pastor Mark from Trinity, uh, had said to me, do you want to have prayer sessions? And I said, absolutely, Pastor, absolutely. So twice a month we have them at City Hall. I'm going to cordially invite uh, Pastor Jeff to join us. Um, the, first, uh, the first one we had, we had five pastors and myself. The next one we had 18. Uh, the last one we just had, we had 20. Um, to me personally, it helps me. Um, to listen to, uh, to the clergy, uh, to hear what their parishioners have to say, uh, and also just to pray. I, I take guidance in that and solace. Um, so when I was elected mayor, some of the things that have happened since I was elected, we had a major water break where 7,000 houses were without water. We had a major blackout where 5,000 households had no electricity. Last weekend, that freaky storm on Friday, again, uh, 2,000 houses without power. And now the coronavirus. So it's only gonna get better, my wife keeps telling me, and I concur with her. Um, so I just wanted to tell you, I just actually left, and I'm sorry I was a little late. Um, yesterday um, was a remarkable day in the city of Brockton. The greatest generation, uh, a man named uh, Mr. Marshall, 95 he was, from South Carolina originally, uh, he took his own life, um, had no relatives. He was an African-American uh, soldier in World War II. He, uh, he passed away, and, and when they found him, he had his medals laid out, his uniform laid out, and a letter of discharge and a letter of congratulations from FDR. Um, again, the Brockton uh, police, three, specifically three individuals that were uh, Army Rangers that now honorably serve the men and women of Brockton, 
took it upon themselves to research. There was no family. Um, so yesterday at Conley Funeral Home, we, we gave a fitting, respectful tribute to, to Mr. Marshall. Now today, same type of situation. Uh, Jose Ortiz uh, passed away at the VA, uh, World War II vet, greatest generation. And that's why I'm late. Russell Peeker had a, a wake for him this afternoon, and he'll be brought down for a final resting in Bourne. Those are the great things about Brockton, um, where we come together as a community. The scary things or the panic things are the coronavirus, and it is a panic right now, and I just want to be very clear. I've been on conference calls with Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, Mike Thomas, the superintendent of schools, and I talk. I talk to him more than I talk to my wife. Um, we closed schools, Brockton Public Schools, for today and for Monday. This weekend, and the Council on Aging as well, I closed. Um, need to protect the young and the elderly seniors, most vulnerable. Um, we're doing a massive, massive disinfecting of all city and school buildings, uh, starting today, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and we'll reevaluate on Monday. We'll have a special city, uh, not a city council, school committee meeting, and the governor will be giving us updates as well. Um, Rest assured, uh, I met two and a half weeks ago, we were ahead of the curve compared to other municipalities. I met with um, the VA, uh, Signature, Good Sam, Father Bill's Mainspring, Brockton Neighborhood Health Center, all the schools, Cardinal Spellman, all of them, uh, and said, listen, we have to come together as a community to figure out <coughs> next steps, best practices. And what I will say is what I hear every single time, the number one thing is, Sanitize, wash your hands, 20 seconds. You know, my kids tend to do it two seconds. It's 20 seconds, disinfect. And if you do have flu-like or, 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 you know, symptoms of illness, call your primary care physician, call your doctor. And again, stay in your house, you know, cough into your sleeve. We can't handshake anymore. We're going to do the fist pump. But it is a serious, people are losing their lives. It is a serious, serious uh, health issue. Um, and here in Brockton, and I know West Bridgewater, neighboring communities, we're being very proactive. But I just wanted to come here to give you some updates on that. I'm getting a lot of calls from people saying, you know, what do we do, what do we do? Well, <clears throat> take care of yourselves in terms of your health, right, health and safety. Um, and what we're doing as an elected officials, and this is the state, state reps, we have three of them, the state senator, um, the city councilors, and the school committee, is we just keep talking and collaborating, um, best practices moving forward. We'll weather this storm, as Pastor just said. Um, but at the end of the day, I, as the mayor, have a duty to make sure that the people that live in the city of Brockton feel safe and are indeed healthy. Um, in terms of the uptick in violence, okay, there's been a lot of gunshots uh, in Brockton. Um, I had a, uh, a round table in my office with law enforcement, both fire police, state police, the district attorney's office. Um, the scary thing for me is this, is, this was happening in February. Uh, what's going to happen in the spring and summer, the warmer months? Um, we had a Stop the Violence Symposium community meeting at Brockton High School Auditorium last week. 96 people attended, 96 residents or business owners attended. Uh, at the table we had um, Brockton Fire, Brockton Police, State Police, School Police. Um, we had the DA's office, um, myself. We had Shirley Azak, Ward 7, uh, City Council, who is the Council President, School Committee, and um, uh, I think that's it for, for, the, for the table. Um, I just want to be clear on this. There's a root cause of this uptick in violence. It's gang activity. It's drug activity. Because Brockton's situated on Route 24, we're seeing these um, criminals uh, coming down from Boston uh, to go down and buy drugs, New Bedford, Fall River, and Brockton as well. I'm not going to say we're, we're not to blame in some capacity. But then they're stopping. And when we saw the double shooting at the Holiday Inn recently up at Westgate, um, that was a drug dealer trying to rob another drug dealer. Um, again, we're talking about humans uh, that are uh, uh, inflicting harm. Um, when there was a random shooting of gunfire at the Westgate Mall, uh, Brockton PD, and God love them, the men and women that serve, uh, they put their lives on the line. They were there in two seconds, and again, it was just random. Nobody was injured, thank God. Um, but I just wanted to, to come here to tell you today um, that as the mayor and as a Brocktonian, you know, I... I I can only say that we're working with all the players, meaning FBI, they're in Lakeville, they come up to Brockton, state police, uh, the DA, Tim Cruz, um, good man, doesn't have to be in Brockton. His office can be anywhere in Plymouth County, uh, but he chooses to be downtown Brockton, and that's important because now we have the state police there as well, the old federal building um, across from the courthouse. 
right, right off where I walk every day. Um, they used to be based in Middleborough. They used to be at the barracks. They weren't in Brockton, the old CPAC, so they're here now. Um, when the uptick started, I, I had uh, just appointed Manny Gomes uh, to be the interim chief. The interim chief. Um, he had been chief under Mayor Belzotti. Um, he's a good person, good, good, proven track record. He's the interim right now. Um, the, the chief of record, John Crowley, is going to be retiring. Uh, he has some health issues, and John, we thank him for his service, but he'll be retiring. But what I said to the interim chief Gomes, I said, we need more police presence on the streets, more cruisers. We need more walking beats. Spring and summer months, I want to see cops out and about. Um, I just authorized 14 new uh, police hires. They're going to be going through the academy. They are going through the academy right now. On the fire side, uh, we just had a graduation a week ago Friday. 12 new firefighters have joined the force. Um, we just uh, um, swore in uh, three new police officers. So we're working on that. We're working on that. We need to continue and do better. Now, as a product of Brockton High School, I got out in 1988. I was in the Red Building. My wife was 89. Two of my kids go to the Brockton Public Schools. One's at Hancock, one's at the uh, Angelo, and my oldest boy's at Trinity Catholic Academy. But for years, the city of Brockton Public Schools has been, quite honestly, cheated. We haven't got the funding. The poorer communities, such as Brockton and Haverhill and Lawrence and Lynn, weren't getting the fundings of the wealthy communities. And in fact, there was a girl that I grew up with and I went to school with named Robin Webby. And the Webby case, um, followed by the Hancock case, followed by the McDuffie case, those were all Brockton students. Those were lawsuits saying uh, inequity in funding. Uh, and we prevailed up to the SJC. Governor Baker just allotted, through the efforts of the state reps in the state center, $21 million to Brockton for public school. Um, you have to deduct $4 million right off the top that goes to the charter school, but that's real money to try to make a difference. And the school committee, and I chair the school committee, we just authorized the hiring of 93 new teachers and paraprofessionals in the school system. So instead of rifting, instead of laying off teachers, uh, and my, one of my sisters is a teacher at the Brookfield. Instead of rifting, we're adding to it. We're adding to the base. We're going to be able to reduce classroom sizes, better for the teachers, better for the boys and girls that are trying to learn. We're also going to be able to enhance uh, the actual physical structures of the schools. The new Brockton High was built 1970, the year that I was born. Not too new anymore. I'm going to be 50 April 27th, so I'm, I'm getting up there. Um, so we have to invest some money there. Um, one pledge that I made on the campaign and uh, now that I've been successful, I'm going to honor that pledge, is we really need to modernize a public safety building. We need to build a new building. We see other municipalities in Massachusetts where they have a combined fire and police. We're trying to find a location right now. I mean, the Campello um, fire station, you know, that's where Sacco and Vanzetti were jailed. I mean, think about how old some of these. Thomas Edison uh, did the other one. I mean, he, he fired it up, you know. Um, so. We're going to take Brockton to the next level. Um, and people say, well, where are you going to come up with the money? You know, how are you going to aff afford this projection is $80 million. Um, well, if you borrow money right now uh, and take out a municipal bond, it's in the history of America. This is probably the best time. It's 2%. Amortize it over 30 years. It's going to pay for itself. Um, we need to do that. We need to give the tools and the toolbox to law enforcement uh, and public safety officials. Um, to make sure that they have what they need to protect and serve us, you know, the taxpayers. I represent each and every one of you. Well, not you, Eldon, but everybody else here that's from Brockton. Um, but again, I just, I wanted to just, I wanted to come here to uh, reintroduce myself to several of you and introduce myself to others. My chief of staff is over there, Kerry Richards. Um, Kerry, uh, thank you, thank you. So Kerry was born in, in Pembroke, Mass., um, so she doesn't know the Brockton politics, which is a good thing, but she went to Villanova, and I won't hold that against her because I went to BC, um, but then she graduated from Harvard Law School, uh, and she worked at the uh, Massachusetts State House, and uh, also just left uh, Boston City Hall. And I said, Kerry, I think you could be great in Brockton. You have to move to Brockton, though. That's a requirement. She was living in Beacon Hill, and she moved before I took office to, 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 to here, to the city. So, and she already registered the vote, so thank you. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's having a team environment at City Hall. Um, I meet every Wednesday at 9 with my department heads. And what I've said from day one is we're in the people business. 
We're in the people business. What that means is we get back to how I was raised with my mom and dad. You say thank you and good morning and you be courteous and you're respectful when people come in. Even when they come in to just pay a bill. You know, how's your day going? Got to get back to the basics, uh, common courtesy. And, and I think another mantra um, is a collaborative approach. Uh, in the days gone by, the mayor was here, city council here, school committee here. Those days are gone. We're all elected every two years by the voters, duly elected. So we all need to work together. Now, I'm not naive to the fact that it's not always a kumbaya moment. We're not always going to agree. But if we can respectfully disagree and have a shared vision of a better Brockton, I think we're in the right, really, we're in the right um, path for success. Now, where Brockton is, and I had a conversation with Lieutenant Governor recently, Karen Polito, about this. I said, listen, if you look at Brockton as a business, a $440 million business known as the city of Brockton, and I happen to be the CEO of that business, we have to make sure that we have a business plan and we execute it in a way that's going to prosper the community that we call home. We got to look at what are the strengths of Brockton. Number one asset of the people of Brockton, right? If Brockton was a stock, you buy it. It's the number one thing of the people. Now, back in the day, we talked about the Swedes or the Lithuanians or my grandparents came from Ireland to work in the factories here, or Maria, my, my wife's great grandparents came from Italy. It's just a different wave of immigrants now. Brockton has always been a community of diversity and, and immigrants. That's what made Brockton Brockton, right? So if you look at a quilt, there's all different pieces of fabric that make up that quilt. Now we just have folks from Cape Verde and Haiti and Angola and Nigeria. And, and I'll tell you, what I learned during the campaign, and uh, I, I walked all seven woods, all 28 precincts. I was a counselor at large for 14 years. What I learned is the goodness of Brockton outweighs the badness. And when we see the bad things on the news, we need to see the good things. The fact that three kids that graduated from Brockton High last year went to Harvard, you know. We have to illustrate really the strength of Brockton. And the fact that we're 35 minutes to South Station and we're seeing younger professionals coming to Brockton and moving here because they can't afford Southie or Dorchester or Quincy or Braintree or Boston or Charleston, they're coming to Brockton now. Right? That's why Kerry left Beacon Hill to come to Brockton. She saved a grand a month on rent. So I think, I think, that's real money. I think what we're going to do together, and that's the key word, together, is to make sure that we really work in a collaborative approach to make sure, number one, the good things of Brockton shine. We minimize the badness, right? The badness isn't going to help us. That's toxic. And we, and we just have a shared vision of a better Brockton. Now, the days of my grandmother running Fannie Farmers on Main Street and my mom and dad meeting at the Center Theater, those, those days aren't here now, right? But what I will say about downtown Brockton is last year, $190 million was invested in Brockton, downtown. Now we have to expand out. We have to look at Kmart Plaza. That place is just abysmal right now. The fact that Shaw's left us a decade ago and Paul Stadinsky, when he was the counselor and I, met and, and we actually came to Town Hall in West Bridgewater because Shaw's, the officials didn't want to meet with us. And what they said was, we don't want competition. We would rather pay the rent for the next 10 years than to have competition in there. That's short-sighted. It's unacceptable. So the people that are living in the high-rises now have to, you know, travel. Um, now on the west side, Stop and Shop's going out at the end of this month. So there's a lot, as my wife says, you sure you want this job? I said, yeah, I definitely want this job. I, I, I can tell you this. My door is open for anybody that wants to come and see me. And what I keep telling my team, they're not my staff, they're not my employees, they're my team. What I'm telling my team is if someone calls or someone comes to visit the mayor's office, whatever that person has to say is the most important thing on that person's mind. So if it's about a pothole or about a light out or about, you know, drug activity or litter, um, we, have to, we have to really maximize our efforts to make sure, because again, we're in the people business. So again, I just want to thank you for the invitation. The food was unbelievable. I had the pumpkin pie. I mean, I, I, all those pies were good. I just lost 63 pounds and I gained some right now. But I'm really here for you and, and I'll answer any questions. Questions, comments? Sir. I do. About the Brock Casino proposal. Does this mean that you count again that you would be willing to work to keep the casino out of Brock? 
Yeah, so, so I grew up right there. I grew up on Wellington Street in Wood, too. I used to play baseball there all the time, the fairgrounds. Now, the city doesn't own the fairgrounds. It's owned by Connie family, right? And Bloom is this billionaire guy that thinks the casino is going to be the pot of gold under, under the rainbow. Um, Senator Brady put in, a, put in a new plan, a revised plan. Um, I don't like the location of that um, for many reasons, not just Brockton High or the church that I go to, but the houses that live on Thurber. Um, they came to see me recently, the powers that be, and I just said, listen, the vote it was a marginal passing. In Wood 1, Wood 3, and Wood 2, it failed. The other, the other wards had passed, but it only passed by 125 votes, right? That was five years ago. What are you? Yeah, well, whatever. I'm not good in math. I'm good in law, but I'm not good in math. So what I said was to the senator and to the reps, I'm, I'm happy to, to look at it. Um, I'll tell you, I'm not going to be a cheerleader for support because I, 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 I don't. I do have some strong reservations about that. Now, the fact that the other casinos in Massachusetts are not, they're not doing well, right? You look at Plain Ridge, Springfield, the Encore. I'm not a gambler, but what I do know is the money projections that these municipalities were told, they're failing. They're not reaching any of those. They're not. So, you know, as the mayor, I think I have a duty to look at it. As a voter, I didn't vote for it, and I won't vote for it, but I think that vote was five years ago. So we need to reconsider, should it be put on a ballot again, or does it just wipe away? The Gaming Commission um, right now uh, is taking commentary from anybody that lives in Brockton. Um, to see if they'll kick the tires for a revisit on that. The Native American tribe, I guess, is, is still trying to see if they can get it in Taunton. Um, I, I just think there's better resources to put there on Route 123 and Belmont Street. Again, the city doesn't own it. Um, I have my own personal feelings about it. Um, but I also know some people think it's a great thing. I, I don't think it is. Thank you. Sir. Uh, Westgate is getting uh, $2 million tax relief. What's being done for Campello to encourage business in the Campello area? Yeah, so w one thing is that, that, that proposal is a TIF, right? Tax incremental financing for Westgate. A um, couple of things that are going to happen at the Westgate Mall in the near future. Um, the Dick's Sporting Goods, that used to be where the old movie theater used to be, that's going to go out. And Dix is, the actual business of Dix is going to move into the mall. So now we're going to have an empty building up there. Um, what do we do? What do we want there? What have I said is I like to contemplate using that as either a two or three screen movie theater. I've said it. Um, some people are saying, no, Netflix is going to, Netflix is going to wipe it out. Not if, we, not if we minimize it. So not a big movie theater like Braintree or Randolph, because I took my kids to Randolph, downstairs in Randolph was closed, right? There's too many movie screens there. Um, so we have to think outside the box. I'm setting up meetings. Same thing with the stop and shop that's going on. I've already spoke to Trader Joe's to see if they'd have some interest in coming there or Whole Foods. Um, in terms of Campello, so um, Mr. Bethany is now the um, president of the Campello Business Association. Mr. Jamula stepped down after many years. Um, I've spoken to them just recently. Eldon, you were there at the card. I went over. Um, Rob May is the city planner economic developer. What I've said is that Campello, Montello, downtown, downtown, those three business associations, plus the Chamber of Commerce, it's great that they meet individually, but let's meet together, right? There's all powers and numbers. Um, you know, Campello has always been a part, a historic part of Brockton but we need to do better, um, we, need, we need to. So I can't look you in the eye and say, yeah, we have X coming to Brockton. All I can tell you is um, we are gonna see a new business coming um, at the old, the old Shaw's. Uh, eventually, it's gonna, it's, some of it is West Bridgewater, some of it's Brockton. There's a trampoline park for kids that's over near Jordan's Furniture, Aviation or something it's called. Um, it's gonna replicate that. Again, it's good for some, it's not good forever. For, for everybody. Um, but again, I, I'm concerned about Kmart Plaza. I'm really concerned about that. Um, I don't want to see, you know, it sit vacant for a long period of time. Um, we learned from the Shaw Center fiasco, and rest assured the Shaw Center, as long as I'm mayor, I don't care if I'm mayor two years or 20 years, we're going to invest to get the Shaw Centers back up. We need to. 
businesses need to happen and is an investment. Many people fell asleep. City Council, I was one of them, um, brought to 21st century. So in terms of business growth, um, after I graduated law school, I went to Boston College Knights to get my MBA, uh, Masters in Business Administration, and, and so I'm a business guy. Um, I'm not the best with numbers, but, uh, but I know how to work with people that are. So I do know that we need to maximize development in Brockton, but also the business that are here, we need to make sure they stay here. When Sorelli Foods left Brockton, up on West Chestnut, over $100,000, that's why they left to go to Middleborough. They went to the mayor at that time and wanted a tax break of 100 grand. The mayor said, absolutely not, and they left. Now, ultimately, they're out of business now, right? But that never should have happened. It's short-sighted. So you have to think long range. And as the mayor, as long as I'm the mayor, I'm a straight shooter. I'll never sugarcoat things. I, I talk to truth. Um, so I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I'm going to do my best to see what we can do to attract businesses. Campello, Montello, downtown, and throughout. Up in the village, too. Lithuanian Village needs to have some business up there. Hey, Janet. Have you completed your cabinet? I have not. My team. My team, no. So, good crazy question, no. Um, so certain mayors, that's, thank you for that. Certain mayors that get elected, most of the mayors, the city of Brockton, when they got elected, they'd wipe out everybody that worked for the former mayor and start fresh. So what I did was um, uh, when, when Mayor Carpenter passed and Mayor Rodriguez took office for six months and then I prevailed, I was elected in November as the mayor-elect, but I knew I wasn't going to get sworn in until January 6th. So I met with every single um, uh, employee, staff member that was in the mayor's office. And I kept some people. They had institutional knowledge. Uh, and it would be really crazy to, to wipe everybody. I didn't keep everybody. I have to add to my own team. But um, I am still adding. Now, I used to be a lawyer at the State House. Um, my junior year at Boston College, I did a semester in DC. And I interned for, he was then our congressman, Brian Donnelly. And uh, so I was on Capitol Hill. And so Capitol Hill, or Massachusetts State House, they have different departments within the elected officials office. One is a community liaison into government affairs, a communications director. The mayors of Brockton never had that. The last chief of staff, great guy named Nick, he was with Bill and Moses, great guy, Nick Gentiquinto, he did everything. He was chief of staff, communications, social media, he did everything. Uh, I don't know how he did it. So Kerry's my chief of staff. Right now we're looking for three people. Um, they've been posted, we've done interviews, we're looking for a communications director. Um, which would be vital right now during this coronavirus, but we're, we're, we're definitely making do. Um, we're looking for, again, a policy into government affairs and then a constituent uh, liaison because I want to make sure that the constituents, the people, um, have a voice, you know? Now, the fact that Brockton is so multicultural with diverse languages, um, you know, that, that's sometimes difficult to fill that, that, that need too. Not everybody speaks all the language. I only speak English. My grandmother taught me swears in Gaelic, but I won't say those. Um, but I, but I still know them. But um, I think, I think at the end of the day, I'm definitely still looking. If anybody has friends, family, relatives interested in maybe working, the thing about Brockton is it's residency required. Okay, if you work in my office, and the other slippery slope is once I'm no longer mayor, again, other mayors have wiped out everybody. So I did have a great candidate the other day, and. I told her the pay's not as good as the private sector, and, but it's gonna be a fun environment and we're gonna work hard and achieve good things. And when I told her she could be gone once, once I was a mayor, she wasn't interested, so. But the website has all the job openings, absolutely. Thank you, good question. Ma'am. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what I was told was that the Gaming Commission um, website, and, and I, I don't have the site, we could get the site to pass, I don't have it off the top of my head, but they have people that are pro and con, and you can, you can send them your, uh, your in information. Ugh. Kids are 
So let me, let me, that's, that's a great thing. Let me just talk about marijuana. I voted no against marijuana. I'm a dad of three little kids. My wife's a physician assistant. Um, she's director of health services at Stonehill. My mom's a nurse. Um, to me, I never smoked pot in my life. I don't like the smell. I don't like the smell of pot of skunks. I like the smell of gasoline, but I, that's a different thing. But I'll, uh, I'll tell you this. I don't think it's a good thing. Um, as someone that's almost 50, um, I just don't think it's a good thing. It passed, so now it can be legalized. So as the chairman of the City Council Ordinance Committee, um, I was chairman out of the 14 years, I think they had me chairman 10 as the, as the, as the lawyer. Um, I took my time um, with my colleagues. When medical marijuana came to Brockton, it passed. Um, what we did originally, Michelle Dubois, who's now the state rep, she at that time was the Ward 6 counselor. She was thinking maybe it'd be located up in the village area. And we, we really looked at everything. Um, and then we said, no, let's put it in an area, we'll call it an overlay district, closer to the highway, not too many houses at all. And Dennis and area, the Ward 3 counselor said, what about West Chestnut Street? So there is a medical marijuana facility there. It's been there for several years now. Then when the recreational passed at the ballot box, we said, okay, now we have to do it again, but now not me medical, now it's recreational. The state told the municipalities, the cities and towns, how many they could have. The mayors, and I wasn't the mayor, at that time the, the previous mayor could enter into these host agreements with these businesses. I was bashed in the enterprise up and down and all around because they said Sullivan's dragging his feet, dragging his feet. No, I wasn't dragging my feet. I was dotting my I's, crossing my T's, doing the legal basis. People said, well, because Sullivan dragged his feet, we lost so much money. We didn't lose a penny because the Cannibal Control Commission, the state commission on marijuana, hasn't even approved any licenses yet. So we haven't lost a dime. Now, are they going to be, com are they going to be coming to Brockton? They are. Um, do I have my own opinions about it? I do. I think the first ones that open will make money, kind of like a liquor store, and then they'll be saturated. I could be wrong. I don't think I'm wrong, but they're coming. Now, the state will determine um, how to give a license, like who gets it. They have to go through a whole checklist. But then, when I was on the ordinance and my colleagues on the city council, we did a law, an ordinance, that when the state approves that person, whatever, Marijuana Enterprises, LLC, whatever that business is, they then have to go back to the City Council of Brockton to get final approval. So the City of Brockton City Council will have final say on that. Um, it's going to happen. What I'm concerned about is, I don't know if you've all noticed, I have, the smell of marijuana is a lot more frequent now. I'm very concerned about people driving when they're high. Uh, there's no really test. There is for alcohol, of course, right? Um, uh, but there's really no medical test right now if you're, and there's no law. Um, Brockton PD is, is actively looking this as well. Um, it's it's going to happen. We need to try to minimize it. I know that there's two proposals up on Pearl Street. There's a proposal down near Brockton Hospital. There's a proposal down near the old ROM Jewelers downtown building. Um, they're, they're scattered about. Um, there is one right now that's operational. So when they were medical marijuana, they were then grandfathered to then offer recreational. So the one that's on West Chestnut for months now has also been offering the recreational. Um, I drive by there at least every other day, going down West Chestnut to my in-laws on Country Club, and they seem to have it configured well. I expected to see a lot of traffic, but um, again, it, it's coming. Um, my humble opinion, it's not a good thing, but I can't stop it. The voters decided. Um, but we need to really try to figure out as a community um, what to do to minimize it. And I do have a lot of faith and confidence in the city council. It's good men and women on the city council, and ultimately those people are going to have to go before. Now, there's three new councilors. There's two new councilors at large, and there's one new ward councilor. So on the city council right now, there's 11 people, seven wards, four councilors at large, and there's three of them that are attorneys. Suna Castro is one. Rita Mendez is one, and Jeff Thompson is one. So um, I think we're in good hands there. I hope. Knock on wood. I hate to cut Yeah, you, no. But um, obviously your visit was very much needed. Thank you, everybody. Um, I've not to, uh, I have to share one laugh with you. Um, 
uh, the mayor's office contacted me yesterday to see if we were on, and I was, of course, in my mind, thinking, of course we're on, we're tough old Swedes. And so um, the tough old Swedes definitely appreciate you being here today. Thank you. And so um, uh, let's offer the mayor a, a, a round of applause. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I'll, leave my, um, I'll leave my business cards with my phone number with Pastor Jeff, and if you want to call me, if you need anything, I mean that, anything, please do call me. God bless you all. Thank you.